everyone. Behind my back, you can see the largest working steam engine in the world, running on a primitive fuel, coal. Nowadays, this type of fuel has lost its relevance and is being replaced by new environmentally friendly alternatives. I wonder if such types of fuel have a future. Well, let's figure it out. By the way, did you know that chemistry is closely intertwined with mathematics? Yes, the use of mathematical methods in chemistry allows scientists to delve deeper into understanding and describing various chemical processes. So, despite my love for chemistry, the title of the main science in the world rightfully goes to mathematics. And you can see for yourself how cool this science is with the help of the interactive platform Brilliant. Here you will find thousands of educational lessons on mathematics and computer science. Essentially, it's a collection of engaging games, ranging from simple to complex. Brilliant customizes content according to your needs and skills. No rush. Solve problems at your own pace. If difficulties arise, you can always use hints. New lessons are added every month, totaling over a thousand. There's everything here. Logic, data science, data analysis, artificial intelligence, neural networks, and much more. Brilliant offers diverse and informative content. For example, in the lesson How Technologies Work, you can learn what makes your password secure, or how recommendation algorithms operate. For the first 30 days, Brilliant is absolutely free. Visit URL or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Since the time of Homo erectus, our ancestors have been using the most common fuel, ordinary dry wood, burning it to obtain energy required for surviving cold nights or for cooking safer and more digestible food. However, wood is not that good a fuel in terms of its energy content, as burning one kilogram of wood releases only five kilowatt hours of energy, which is why the fire often burns out so quickly and you constantly need to add more firewood. But still, after a million years of using firewood or charcoal by the upright man, other types of fuel have been discovered. And the first one of them was black coal, which was used alongside firewood for heating primitive stoves about 200 to 300 years BC. The reason for the late discovery of black coal is the difficulties in locating it on the surface of the earth. Another difficulty is the extraction and transportation of coal from primitive mines to the surface. Moreover, the ignition of hard coal is a challenging task, since this process is rather slow without additional heating or air supply. I tried to do it with the help of ignition tablets, but the process took a very long time. Besides, hard coal emits smoke with a terrible stench due to the release of so-called coal gas. I managed to ignite this pile of coal properly only with the supply of pure oxygen, which combusted this fuel perfectly. Over time, all the coal was well heated and began to burn with the release of a large amount of energy. After all, its energy content per kilogram is two times higher than that of wood. With the passage of time, besides substituting firewood in stoves, hard coal also became widely used in blacksmithing because of its ability to produce very high temperatures without additional fuel for a long time. In the course of technological development, at the beginning of the 18th century, hard coal with high energy content was used in the first steam engines, in which ordinary wood burned too quickly and couldn't provide enough energy to accelerate the flywheel. At this time, mechanization was implemented everywhere, the energy for which was provided by the regular coal that was mercilessly burned in steam boilers of that time. One of these mechanisms is the world's largest still-functioning steam engine, located in the Kempton Steam Museum in England. This engine, which about a hundred years ago pumped water from the Thames River to the adjacent neighborhoods of London, is given a test run several times a month. The power of this engine is as much as a thousand horsepower, and it's a copy of one of the engines that were installed in the famous Titanic, the sad fate of which I think is probably familiar to you. Nevertheless, thanks to the workers of the museum, nowadays you can observe this miracle of engineering of the past and understand how powerful the steam engines were at that time. But still, no matter how beautiful and powerful steam engines were, 
their efficiency, safety, and reliability left much to be desired. Besides, the usage and maintenance of the steam engine required a huge number of trained personnel. For example, the above-mentioned Titanic required 307 people to operate two steam engines like this one, which was rather inconvenient and expensive. It should be noted that by that time, mankind had discovered petroleum as a source of energy in addition to coal. Chemist Mendeleev once said, burning petroleum as fuel would be akin to firing up a kitchen stove with banknotes. Therefore, to obtain energy from petroleum in the most efficient way, it should be processed first. In other words, it should be distilled like an alcoholic beverage through a rectification column, thus obtaining its main fractions, namely gas, gasoline, kerosene, diesel, and other heavy fractions that can be used as fuel. That is why progress didn't stand still. And at the end of the 19th century, Edward Butler and Rudolf Diesel introduced to the public two completely new types of internal combustion engines, powered by gasoline and diesel fuel, respectively. Gasoline, as the lightest liquid fraction of oil, has two and a half times more energy content than wood, and one and a half times more energy than black coal. Gasoline consists mainly of a mixture of easily boiling hydrocarbons, from which it partially boils even at the human body temperature and easily spurts out of the pipette. Besides that, gasoline has a high partial pressure of vapors. The process of obtaining the first gasoline for petroleum was quite simple. Moreover, the gasoline engines produced way less smoke and noise in comparison with dirty and inefficient diesel engines of that time. Because of this, Historical progress went first on the way of the development of gasoline internal combustion engines, in which every energy was extracted from fuel not by simple combustion of gasoline in the air, but by combustion of air-fuel mixture in the cylinders of the piston engine system. Interesting fact, many of the cars built from the 1930s to the 80s were equally efficient and consumed from 10 to 30 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers obviously except for some sports cars, such as Bugatti Royale, which consumed about 120 liters per 100 kilometers and weighed three tons. Nevertheless, since the oil crisis of the 1970s, more and more car manufacturers started to think about improving the efficiency of their cars, as well as the transition to alternative fuels, which would be cheaper and more environmentally friendly. The first fuel that could replace the ubiquitous gasoline at the time was ordinary alcohol, obtained by rectification of mash. For example, from the digestion of sugarcane, which is still massively grown in the Brazilian jungle. That's why Brazil still remains the leader in ethanol production, and a lot of their cars run on alcohol. I wonder how efficient and environmentally friendly it would be to make gasoline-powered cars run on alcohol. In terms of energy content, ethanol releases about 30% less energy than gasoline. I wonder how a regular gasoline engine would run on it. To answer this question, I asked the YouTube channel Ilner to provide me with some footage from his video about testing a motorcycle fueled with pure ethanol. First of all, he had to drill the carburetor jets to increase the fuel supply about two times because the bike couldn't keep the revs and start normally on the stock configuration. After the first start, we discovered the first surprises. As you can see, the difference is obvious. There are some lags. It feels like the performance is about 40% higher. Top speed has increased too. It's actually using twice as much fuel. I barely touch the throttle and the revs are at 4,000. I'm driving in fourth gear and I can see the fuel level dropping right in front of my eyes. It turns out that according to the tests, ethanol consumption is more than two times higher than that of gasoline. However, the power at low revs has also increased. Actually, we're dealing with the unoptimized engine as the octane rating of ethanol is higher than that of 95 RO in gasoline, and it can be used in engines with higher compression ratios. In addition, the low energy content of ethanol is responsible for high fuel consumption. After all, the less energy fuel releases during combustion, 
the bigger amount of it is required. According to the scientific data, the use of ethanol as a biofuel is definitely not as profitable as green energy advocates expected it to be. Filling the gas tank with alcohol is beneficial only in those countries where it is produced in large quantities, like Brazil. Producing ethanol from wheat and other agricultural crops, like corn, is much less efficient, and moreover, the production of bioethanol increases the prices of groceries. The point is that according to the latest legislation in the USA and Europe, bioethanol can be produced not only from waste, but also from normal products that can be consumed by people, which creates competition in the market. As a result, products in many stores become more expensive due to the fact that they're competing with the producers of alcohol, which is added to gasoline in many countries to improve the so-called ecological balance. Although, the official information provided on the USDA website says that carbon dioxide emissions are reduced by 24% by adding 15% of ethanol to gasoline. However, the intensification of corrosion processes and increasing attrition of engines are not mentioned there. As a result, it turns out that driving on alcohol isn't as environmentally friendly as it appeared. Taking into account the modern development of internal combustion engines and catalytic converters, there are more questions than answers. In addition, considering the fact that tons of grain must be grown to produce bioethanol, which leads to soil erosion, increased fertilizer consumption, and the destruction of other small animals due to deforestation, it's a rather controversial topic. At the beginning of the 20th century, diesel, which is a heavier fraction of petroleum distillation, began to be used as fuel in addition to gasoline. Compared to volatile gasoline, diesel fuel consists of heavy, saturated hydrocarbons, which burn only when heated or absorbed into some porous materials, producing rather thick soot. Due to the fact that fuel in a diesel engine is ignited not with a spark, but with pressure, such engines were very noisy and smoky, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. For this reason, the auto industry developed much quieter gasoline engines, where diesel engines were used mainly for agricultural and industrial machinery. But in the 80s of the 20th century, the Peugeot company manufactured new models of diesel engines with indirect injection and turbocharging. The diesels became faster, much more efficient, and not so smoky. Such engines could work not only on diesel, but also on more viscous sunflower oil. And since the 80s of the 20th century, people started to use a completely new type of fuel, Biodiesel. Biodiesel is produced from regular vegetable oil. In my case, it is a rapeseed oil. To make a biofuel, I first heat it to 133 degrees Fahrenheit with a magnetic stirrer and control the temperature with a common food thermometer. While the oil is heating, I measure out the catalyst for the reaction, 1 8 ounce of potassium hydroxide. Then I dissolve it in pure methanol also known as wood alcohol, obtaining potassium methanolate mixed with ethanol. We get the so-called alkaline medium in methanol. By the time everything dissolved, the thermometer in the oil flask beeped, indicating it had warmed to the required temperature. To make biodiesel, I simply pour the resulting potassium methanolate into the heated oil with the stirrer and cover the flask. Over time, the oil in the flask which from the chemical point of view is a triglyceride of fatty acids, reacts with the methanol in an alkaline medium to form glycerol and the biodiesel itself, which is a mixture of fatty acid methyl esters. The color of the solution gradually turns darker. It takes some time for the reaction to complete. I decided to leave the mixture in the flask for three hours with stirring. Three hours later, I pour the contents of the flask into a separatory funnel in which the mixture immediately begins to separate into glycerol in the lower part and biodiesel itself in the upper layer of the solution. In an hour, there are two clearly separated layers in the funnel, heavy glycerol and light biodiesel. The latter still needs to be purified from the residual alkali and possible saponification products of the vegetable oil. To do this, I spray some water on the top layer and wait for it to settle to the lower glycerin layer. It turns out that water retains in biodiesel for a very long time. So I decided to wait another 12 hours for the liquids to fully separate. The next day, the top layer of biodiesel has lightened a bit, and I think it can be separated from the bottom layer of glycerol. After separation, the resulting biodiesel is still slightly cloudy. Apparently, it still contains quite a lot of water impurities, which should be removed. 
To do that, I pour anhydrous magnesium sulfate into the flask with biodiesel, which is supposed to absorb the excess water, thereby purifying the biodiesel from impurities. This process wasn't quick and took another 24 hours, after which I finally got pure biodiesel. The only thing left to do is separate it from the magnesium sulfate precipitate and the so-called fuel of the future is ready. Yeah, biodiesel is certainly great, but how efficient is this fuel? And how will a regular diesel engine run on it? I think we need to conduct an experiment. Since fueling a modern car with my homemade biodiesel is quite dangerous because of the risk of damaging its delicate fuel system, I decided to buy a simple diesel engine, without a turbine and other advances. I think it'll work even on ordinary oil, which I've already prepared in advance, along with biodiesel and ordinary diesel. If you compare the viscosity of these liquids, you can see that regular and biodiesel are quite fluid, unlike rapeseed oil. However, comparing the combustibility of all three fuels, you can see that they don't catch fire at all when poured into a container. To make them ignite, you need to soak something porous, for example, a napkin, thus increasing the area of combustion. You can see that all three liquids burn approximately the same with a bright, sooty flame. To check the consumption of different types of fuel in my engine, I decided to modify its fuel system and replace the fuel tank with a measuring cylinder with a fairly accurate scale. Because of the strange arrangement of pipes, it was quite a difficult task, but after some manipulations, I even managed to start my engine with this modification of the fuel system. When all the air came out of the fuel pipe, the engine stopped smoking and started to work on a regular diesel. After the engine has warmed up a bit, I pour some more diesel into the cylinder and wait until the fuel level drops to 150 milliliters. At this point, I turn on the stopwatch and start measuring the time it takes the engine to consume 100 milliliters of fuel. I will do the same with all other fuels. In general, the experiment went quite smoothly. The engine didn't smoke and the exhaust fumes smelled like a familiar old diesel, without any newfangled catalysts and other filters. Once the fuel level in the cylinder had dropped to 50 milliliters, I stopped the stopwatch and used the formula to calculate the average consumption of the normal diesel fuel per hour, which is 425 milliliters per hour. To test the engine with another fuel, I wait until the level of diesel drops to the minimum. In the meantime, I decided to throttle up a bit to check the soot that immediately emerges as the revs increase. After the diesel in the cylinder had nearly run out, I poured in some homemade biodiesel and waited for it to run through the entire fuel system of the engine and replace the diesel. It took about 10 minutes, and I noticed that the smell of the exhaust had also changed and started to resemble some kind of overfried potatoes or burnt oil. Now, I refill the cylinder with fuel again and wait for the level to drop to 150 milliliters. As soon as this happens, I start the stopwatch again and measure the time it takes for the engine to consume 100 milliliters of fuel. In general, at first, the engine ran on biodiesel in the same way as on regular diesel, but over time, the fuel in the pipe began to foam badly because of the vibrations, so air bubbles got into the fuel system, which slightly disturbed the stable operation of the engine. By the end, real biodiesel foam completely filled the tube. As soon as the fuel level dropped to the 50 milliliter mark, I stopped the stopwatch again and calculated the average consumption of the engine per hour. It's 454 milliliters per hour, which is 7% higher than that of conventional diesel. And this is not surprising because the energy content of biodiesel is about 14% less than that of conventional diesel so the increase in consumption is reasonable. I decided to throttle up once again on the remains of biodiesel in the cylinder, and in general, I didn't see any difference from conventional diesel in terms of smoke. The only and the main difference was a completely different smell of emissions, but I wouldn't say that it was more pleasant than conventional diesel. It smelled like burning oil. I decided to conduct the third experiment with the most viscous and simple fuel I had, ordinary rapeseed oil which is still used to fuel some tractors in the warm season. As I'd done before, I first flushed the fuel system of the previous fuel residue, which could be clearly seen as the biodiesel residue foam disappeared from the tube. Once clean oil had started to flow into the engine, I poured fuel into the cylinder one more time and waited for it to reach the required mark, after which I started the stopwatch. 
Interestingly, while the engine was running on oil, the smell of fumes was practically the same as that of biodiesel. However, the engine started to smoke, and it was getting harder to breathe because of the stronger odor of burning oil. After all, oil has a high flash point, and part of it doesn't combust in the engine cylinder. After the engine had consumed 100 milliliters of oil, I stopped the timer and calculated the consumption of oil. It's 419 milliliters per hour, which is almost comparable to the consumption of regular diesel. In terms of energy content, oil has 16% more energy per kilogram of weight at full combustion. Apparently, this is the reason why the engine smoked when running on oil, as the excess oil and carbon residue were emitted into the atmosphere. Similar to biodiesel, the engine produces quite a lot of smoke when running on oil, so there's no big difference with other fuels. Comparing the price per liter of all types of fuel, for example, in Europe, it's clear that it's still more profitable to drive on conventional diesel. Moreover, biodiesel and regular oil turn into a gel at low temperatures. As you can see, it's impossible to start the engine on this gel, so biodiesel and oil are suitable only for countries with a warm climate. As for environmental friendliness, there are many controversial points, just like with bioethanol. Biodiesel itself is more expensive than regular diesel, and its availability varies greatly from country to country. For example, I couldn't find it anywhere at gas stations in Estonia. In case biodiesel is produced from products suitable for food, it creates competition and consequently the price increases. Besides, nowadays, biodiesel is used mainly in Europe and the USA. In other words, the developed countries where its production is funded by the state. Of course, it is possible to produce biofuels from food waste, but the method is still unclear because it's impossible to extract much oil from banana peels and inedible plants to produce biodiesel. So it is also very controversial. One thing I can say for sure, biofuel is hardly suitable for saving future generations from climate change. We should change the entire transportation system and abandon outdated technologies. For example, we should switch to public transportation and avoid excessive usage of private cars, but this is my humble opinion. Well, I think after watching this video, you've learned more about the above mentioned types of biofuel, methods of their production, and their advantages and disadvantages. And if you enjoyed this video, as always, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel to see many more new and interesting things.